Come on, recording. Hey, how's it going, universe? Welcome to another episode of Zoobox Goes to the Movies. Again, past and future guests, Dan Prophet coming back strong, bringing us into the international, our first international cinema, first international outing. Pretty impressive. Does Kubrick count as international because he's like a lime? I guess, I mean, technically, he, you know, everything post, what, uh, I think 2001 was, like, all in England? Yeah. So it's, it's possible. I guess we could, I mean, on a technic- technicality, sure. But this is going to be the classiest episode of Zoobox because there is subtitles and it's black and white. I know. I know. It took me, I had to watch it six times just to understand it, just to get through <laughs> it. I, I am going to thoroughly butcher every single name and pronunciation. Oh, yeah. Uh, everything. So, you know, it's, it's like, uh, actually, because today, everybody, we're talking about the tale of Zato Ichi. Now, I say that because of what you just said, because I didn't know how to pronounce that until the other day. Like, you know, in like in our English parlance. Like, I just didn't know what it would sound like because I had never said it out loud. I realized, I was like, I knew Zato Ichi. I knew the Blind sword, Swordsman. I knew the series. I think I've seen, like, you know, uh, a few here and there over the years. Um, but it's not something I'd ever really delved too deeply into. And uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. I, and it was the last Zoobox goes to the movies. I had to do a bunch of Indian names. It's like, God damn, what a gambit. What a fucking gambit. Anyways, so The Tale of Zato Ichi is a, the 1962 film directed by Kenji Musumi, uh, written by Minoru. <laughs> here we go. Minoru Inuzaku, um, adapted from a short story of the same name by Kan... Can- Shimizoa. It stars Shinotaro Katsu as the titular Zadoichi, or the blind man Ichi, as it is literally translated, and uh, a whole host of others. Shigeru Amachi plays Harate, the uh, the rival samurai, I guess. And the logline plot synopsis is the adventures of a blind gambling masseur who also happens to be a master swordsman. Well, that tells you nothing. <laughs> but anyway, so you recommended this movie. Yeah, is, is this a movie you've been like uh, you've watched over the years? You've been familiar with it, or what's the deal with that? Uh, yeah, well, the last one we did was Mad Max, and uh, in the vein of um, sort of anti-hero vigilantes, um, you know, when I, when I was combing through the you know movies that I might want to do with you that you might enjoy, I thought, oh man, like the Blind Swordsman, that is one of the great heroes of all time. Um, and you know, in, in uh, sort of mainstream American um, cinema, you wouldn't hear hear about it a lot. Um, I stumbled upon it. I don't know even how I stumbled upon it. I think it was. Um, I think I was watching just uh, bits of old samurai movies on YouTube mm-hmm. or something years ago um, when you could first start getting YouTube on your Xbox or whatever. I was just going through it on TV. Yeah, and uh, these clips of those blind swordsmen would come up. And uh, it was just super intriguing. Though I, I liked the way that the sword fights were always um, framed in a way that were very clean and not overly flashy. Mm-hmm. Like, as is said in the movie, you barely see his sword at all. You just hear it slapping back into its sheath. Yeah. You know what I mean? And um, as much as I love a good Anakin Skywalker versus Obi-Wan Kenobi over a pit of lava, like swashbuckling, stupid bullcrap. Yeah. Um, the sword fighting in the Zatoichi movies intrigued me so much because it was so straightforward. And I don't want to say more realistic because I've never actually seen people sword fight in real life, like to the death. Yeah. Um, but it seems like that's the way that it would actually go more is these more um, straightforward, clean movements and not this spinning your sword around 18 times. Yeah. And so that led to me watching, not in any order, several of the Zatoichi movies. Um, and then that led me to going, well, where did it all start? And that's when I watched this one. And this one to me was like sort of the most coherent story of any of the ones that I had seen. And it is just a very like succinct kind of beginning, middle, end. Um mm-hmm. That's one of the reasons why I like it so much. It's because it's a very simple movie, and that's why I wanted to talk about it specifically. You know, the Zatoichi character and his movies as a whole, but this movie in and of itself is just a beautifully self-contained story. Yeah, it's a great introduction to the character, and I think you know, 
a lot of people like maybe even yourself, like, you know, you, you find out about these things through like, you know, watching clip reels and whatnot about like Samurai or the 10 best, you know, Samurai movies ever made. And usually Zatoichi is on there. Um, and it's, it, I was, I was kind of surprised how kind of low key it was. Like you said, like, it's not flashy. It's not, it's actually really a character study about not just Zatuichi, but the world that Zatu, Zatuichi has to exist in and all right. of the characters that surrounding him. Like he's kind of an archetypal character in the same way that in the Western world, we kind of had Westerns. Like we have the old Westerns and the, like with the, with the kind of uh, like something like, you know, I guess uh, Clint Eastwood would have is kind of some of his like spaghetti Western movies. He has a similar vibe to Zatuichi where he's like this guy, a drifter who has kind of a dark past and he's coming, he comes into a town and he just has to react to kind of what's going on in the town. And then people trying to use him for whatever nefarious purpose or, 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 or whatnot. And I think uh, Zatuichi still has that same thing. And like you said, like we're so used to, I think we're so accustomed to like the overly flashy choreography that it was nice to watch a movie that just like kind of went at its own pace, like told a really great story, had a really great central figure. And also all of the choreography is uh is part of his character like his cleanness his ability like they're not they're purposely not trying to be flashy because Zatuichi is kind of the best like he doesn't have to do much everything is calculated and like you said i think like if you were to take a more realistic view of what it was like for these guys to fight that's what it would be like it would be like this this you know this intense like three move chess match like, like you both are very skilled, but it all only takes one slip up and you're right. done. You're getting cut in half. You're right. getting your gut spilled out, you know? And even it, it is even stated by the character in the part at the beginning where the, he's having the, uh, the cat, the coward Tate, uh, give him a massage <laughs> and, um, the mob boss, I have, I'm sorry, I have the words written down so I don't forget them. Uh, Sukugoru. Yes. The uh, kind of slimy uh, Yakuza boss that he gets thrown in with says, you know, hey, uh, bring uh, Ichi in here and have him do some of his sword tricks. And Zatoichi's like, mm, no, uh, sorry, somebody of my caliber doesn't really go in and do tricks. And then, like, there are so many wonderful moments for him, between him and Tate, like, where he, uh, he says, no, I'm not going to go in there and do tricks especially for somebody like your boss, right, Tate? And Tate's like, uh, like, he just gives, like, this, <laughs> this awkward grunt, like he's such a fucking coward, you know what I mean? Yeah. He's almost ready to agree with Zatoichi in that moment. But, um, yeah, there's so much going on, like you said. The movie is so much more than just a uh, sword fight between, like, they're the wonderful climax of the sword fight between these two is the centerpiece of the movie. Mm-hmm. But there's so much more going on, um, not just with the relationship between Ichi and the samurai uh, Hirati and the B plot with uh, Tate and the girl that he, that the baby he won't take responsibility for and the girl who kills herself and um, this like weird little battle that's going on between these Yakuza bosses that literally amounts to nothing in the end. You know what I mean? And, uh, you know, in that moment where Tate is massaging Ichi, the 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 mob boss Sakuro, um, Sukigoro rather, he's so offended that Ichi won't come in and do the sword tricks for him. But then the thing that breaks that awkward moment and sort of lets that dishonor slip is the fact that Tate, a man who can see, is giving a massage to a blind man. Yeah. And that makes everybody laugh because in that era in Japan, a blind person was generally the masseuse. That's one of the only ways they can Mm -hmm. make a living. And it's very ironic and weird. And of course, dishonorable to Tate who becomes the heel of like everything in this movie uh, that he's giving him the massage. And so like little things like that wouldn't be, you you sort of have to read along with a historical thesaurus when you're watching yes. a movie like this or like at the currencies, I had no idea how much Ichi was being hired for. I had to look it up and try to sort of like translate it into today's currency to figure out how much money he was putting his life on the line for. I, th- 
figured it was somewhere between like ten and twelve thousand dollars or something like that. Yeah, uh, it's it's because it's a story that happens, like you said. There's a lot of uh, you know culturally specific Japanese things that probably people you know in Japan where the movie was made and where it came out originally probably were more familiar with in the same way that we were kind of familiar with a lot of uh, I guess to just to say it again the Western stereotypes we kind of like understood on some sort of cultural level what these things were supposed to be and what they were what they represented how the world kind of worked at that time um, and so I think it'd be really easy to kind of be confused by this movie if you don't go investigate also it's a story that basically is happening after it's like the post story it's like the epilogue the all of the zatuichi movies are the epilogue to his story in a weird way uh because you know a few years before the story takes place and they are not explicit they don't really discuss this very much in, in the movie at all if 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 at all in this movie actually is that like he gets blinded like five or six years before the story takes place he can't so and then he decides to like take up the sword because he wants to have like dignity and honor and he wants to still be part of society. He doesn't want to just be a masseuse. He ends up working with Yakuza people. Those are the only people that would take him in. He ends up becoming kind of like a uh, like a well-known murderer to a certain extent. He was like a mercenary. And this story basically picks up like after he's had kind of a an awakening where he wants to make amends for his life. Like he doesn't want to do this anymore. And that's kind of part of the tragedy of it. But if you don't under, if you don't know that going in, I could understand like people being like, what the fuck is going on? Like what, right. who is this person? What's going on? I think, you know, in a vacuum, I think you can still un understand and enjoy like the basic beats of the, of the current story that's being told, but there's so much that informs it that I wasn't aware of the first time I saw it. And it enriched the experience so much actually when I went back and like did a little reading I, uh, I read the short story that this is based on, and um, it really informs stuff. And I was just kind of surprised at how almost, I guess the the word, the phrase is mise-en-scene it is. It's like in the midst of the story, like when you meet Zatoichi. Yeah. I think that that's why it was so successful as sort of a serial to me, because I came in watching like Zatoichi on the road and uh, a couple of the other later ones where – you know, they don't even deal with, well, I guess they, in some of them, they deal with his backstory a little more, but like you said, it's just kind of like episodic. Like it just takes the character as he is. Mm -hmm. It hops right into the story and you learn sort of the details of the story, a little bit of the background, but it's storytelling sort of takes you understanding for granted. Like you just got to hop in there with it and understand. Yes. Yeah. And, um, one of the things that one of the themes that constantly comes back through is like you said, his desire to pull out of the profession of killing, but he can't. <clears throat> and, um, that's one of the things that struck me early on, uh, specifically this, uh, I, I, I saw these movies when I started, or I actually started to watch them more when I started to, um, do the slaughter bit more. And one of the things that struck me was uh, a scene in a later one, I believe, I think it's Zatoichi on the road, but I can't remember because there's so many of them. There's like 26 of them. Mm -hmm. There's a scene where he goes to a temple to pray. He's about to visit several temples and he's about to go on his journey. And he gets up in the morning and prays to God that he doesn't have to kill anybody that day. Yeah. And, uh, he, he there's this beautiful shot of him and he's in like the the sun hat you know what i mean and it's panning around him and he's praying that you know he's not going to actually have to take any life that day even though the irony of that scene and, and, and the tragedy of that scene is that you the viewer knows that that's exactly what he's going to have to do yeah because that's the whole move you know, there wouldn't be a movie if satsuichi doesn't Go in and cut sixteen yakuza heads off. <laughs> Zatuichi yeah. twenty seven. Zatuichi's perfect Sunday. Right, exactly. <laughs> so you you know you know what's going to happen, and that's the sad thing about this character is that he so badly wants to pull out of that and not do that anymore, but he is bound to it. Who else could do that but him? But it's also being bound to. But it's also there's an element of um, because this is where his backstory comes in. These are consequences. Like people know who he is. 
there's like bounties on his head are all around Japan. So when he's like kind of traveling, going places, people are like, oh, it's that you're blind. You have a sword like you're are you Zatoichi? If you're Zatoichi, we're going to fucking kill you. Yes. And it, well, it, it, that that comes more later on that that uh, that does factor into it. But also, I think that there's a, a element to his character that he realizes that the the innocent people of these towns will be terrorized by these Yakuza scumbags. Oh, by people like him. Comes, yeah. Like, like, yeah, they're like, yeah. nobody else is going to be able to stand up to them, but him. And, you know, and, and you know, so he becomes the Mad Max, the, the Batman, uh, the vigilante. And part of it is that he's pulled into it and, and he can't get out. But part of it is that I think that he wouldn't allow himself to be pulled from it, even if he could. Yeah, I think he feels like it's like his comeuppance. It's his. It's his. The way he can make amends. Like this is his life's work now. Is to do yeah. these. Is to go do these things. Yes. Um. Like there's a beautiful line towards the end of the movie after they have like kind of the uh, the the sword fight on the bridge between him and Harate, is when he's talking to uh, what's his name? He said his name like five times. Uh, Shigaraku. Sukigoro. Sukigoro, and Sukigoro's laughing. He's like, oh, we've won. Isn't this glorious? And he's have just a like, drink. have a drink. Have a drink. We're having fun. Isn't this great? And he's like, he's like, look, all these people are fucking dead for what? All, and, and he's like, and I had to kill somebody that I haven't had a friend in forever. And I had to kill this man, this one person that I could connect with on a deeper level. And he's like, and, and he's like, because we have to do it. Like, this is our code. If we don't do this, nobody's going to do it. And we're all just going to fall. We're all just going to be like you. Because we have to live by some sort of a, a, a value set that not every, everybody's kind of drifting away from. Like it's kind of it's almost a weird transitionary period in history where people are starting to kind of move away from the kind of their older traditions. And you see this new generation of kind of like uh, gangs, I guess, would be the equivalent. Like, you know, you, you, the Yakuza just are not the same things as like kind of these noble swordsmen. Of the of the yesteryear and Zatuichi Harate, they are represent kind of this old guard of 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 a way of life that is that is about honor. It's about purpose in a way that doesn't seem like everybody else's. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean because all these Yakuza guys are all cowards. I mean, they, during the final yes. fight, you see Suki Goro literally run away. Yeah, several times during the final fight, and. That's why uh, Master Hirate, Mickey, uh, he finds it so distasteful to to die in a fight with these Yakuza scumbags because they're just a bunch of cowards. He knows that they're going to gang up on him, five or six or 20 of them, however many of them they need to gang up on him or shoot him with a rifle or something. And he is so much more happy to die at the hands of Zatuichi than to die of consumption or dishonorably at the hands of these assholes. Yeah. And that's why I think one of the reasons that this is one of my favorite Zatoichi movies is that the quote unquote main antagonist is such a beautiful character. He's such a beautiful character. Miki Harate is one of my favorite characters in this sort of like Kung Fu genre type thing. Um, his his path to redemption is so far that he knows he's going to die and all he wants in life, the only thing he wants in life except to have a drink of warm sake is to die honorably, get one last chance to redeem himself as a samurai because, you know, he has this nameless failure. Yeah. He's running away from and Satsuichi represents that last shot for him to die honorably. And they both know that even though they're the only people in the world, it, it's like, it's like Michael Jackson sitting down with like Paul McCartney or something and being yeah. like, we're the only people in the room that could even possibly know what it's like to be who we are. Mm -hmm. And the rest of these people are all just fucking charlatans. But unfortunately we have to destroy each other in Michael and Paul's case through litigation over the Sony <laughs> BMG Beatles catalog. And in Zatoichi, it is over this stupid Yakuza war, as um, 
as Master Harati says when in that beautiful scene where Ichi and here are drinking together, you know, uh, I've always wanted to fight you, but I didn't want it to be over some stupid war. I know. know, yeah. And and it's just it's such a beautiful character. Few characters are set up so beautifully. Very few characters are placed on the chessboard as beautifully as Miki Hirate is. And I love to watch his entire story play out from the first moment that they're fishing together up until their last moment together on the bridge where he finally, you know, after he gets stabbed through the fucking gut, his, his, his word is like fantastic or something like that. He's like so happy. Oh, Cause he, he's so, he's also so enamored. He's so impressed. Yeah. Like he's just, he, just like another craftsman. Like, Oh my God, I found you brother. Like it's yeah. such a beautiful moment. Like that whole, the, the way that scene plays out with, uh, you, you know, Harate falling on the bridge and then, and Zatuichi like going to his knees and the tears and like the beautiful cinematography, which this is a beautiful looking movie. Oh, it, it, so good. So like so many gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous shots. How is it that this movie is so gorgeous, but like American movies at the time look like such fucking garbage? It depends on who who is directing it, right? Like, I'm sure there's plenty of garbage in Japan too. Like, you know, we see the good stuff that come that makes its way over here. That's true. true. Yeah, like there's just some of the shots, the close-ups of the faces are so crisp, and and I guess the acting is so wonderful too. But like, I mean, just everything that you know, I don't have the 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 cinematography vocabulary to actually to word it properly, but everything is just framed so tastefully and yeah and, and in a way that conveys quickly to you the viewer even though it's in black and white even though it's in japanese what's going on no it's beautifully cinematic like you said like everything feels purposeful every every shot like means something and it's meant to convey kind of the subtext of the scene and that's another what a, another beautiful part of this movie is how kind of subtle it is like i said earlier that it's kind of a low-key movie it's not there trying to hold your hand like, you know, what Dan was just saying about Harate is not obvious if you're not like paying attention. Like that's something you could you could miss that. Like you could totally miss that in the character if you're not if you're passively watching this movie or if you only watch it for the first time. There are so many like little moments in the performances and then paying attention to the to the to the way they talk about things and the and the the dialogue cuz it's not it's just like it feels very organic. It's not like reading somebody like writing a monologue like in a play where they're like telling you. It's not like a Tarantino character. It's like, you know, well, actually, maybe it is a little bit like a Tarantino character, uh, just less uh, verbose. But um, well, one of my one of my favorite line readings of all time of anything is one word when when Harate runs out and he's he sees that he sees uh, Zatoichi on the bridge and he exclaims Zatuichi and and like the way dude like the way he says it he is so happy and relieved and like he he expresses so many emotions in that one line yeah so excited so relieved he finally gets to get this moment he 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 almost sounds like a kid who like Walt runs into the candy store and finds that no one's there to stop him from taking as much candy as he wants. Well, because he knows that Zatuichi is an honorable man who will give him an honorable death. Like he knows that in that moment, he thinks he might get overtaken by these assholes as he's slicing through people. He's trying to, he's trying to like, they're, you know, they're having this kind of this dumb fight and he knows that like, Oh, at some point my, my illness, my, the consumption is tuberculosis was going to get the better out of, get the better of him. And then he sees Zatuichi, and he's like, "Oh, thank God, thank and, God." And, and 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 also, there's an element I think to it, Sean, that he knows that as as awesome as a samurai as he is, he's not going to win a sword fight with Zatuichi, even doing his best. And so he's guaranteed, almost, he's almost guaranteed an honorable death. Yeah, he knows it's it's like it's like a sure thing. I don't. I, I, I and that's, and, but that's the beautiful thing about it. That's like the most beautiful thing about it is that it's not. He's going to try his best. He's not going to go there and let Zatuichi kill him. Like that's right. not how this works. Yeah. But Zatuichi, he knows, and ins- just instinctively, maybe it's from reputation or just from hanging out with him or whatever. He just knows 
Like talent, I actually wrote a note. I said, "Talent knows talent." Like you can't because that Tuichi when they're drinking, he tries to downplay. He's like, "Oh, you know, I know parlor tricks." You know, I'm just a blind guy, and he's like, "No, dude, like I can, I feel it. I feel you." He's I like, I, I, I see the muscle. I see the muscle on your right arm is different. I know yeah. what that's like. Yeah, which is something that would be specific, like only somebody like Harate would notice and be like, "Ah, okay, now we we're, we got something here." And I love actually that is probably my favorite scene in the movie, other than the the scene on the bridge because it is it's it's like powerful. It's like a powerful moment in the movie. Is is when they're drinking sake, when they have yeah, when they're and, drinking uh, to the dead woman who killed herself. Uh, one of my favorite lines in the movie is when they say uh, there won't be any more killing today, not even fish, and yeah, yeah. And then they go and drink their sake and give each other massages, and <laughs> I mean it's it's like. How many films take the time to set up any characters that well, let alone the hero and the quote unquote villain? You know, like that's just fucking so that's why that's why it's one of my favorite movies. It takes the time. You know, it does take the time because I think like, you know, from like a cultural perspective or a zeitgeist, if you've never seen these movies, you're probably going to expect something very different. You're not going to expect something this thoughtful, which is something, you know, to give credit a lot of Japanese samurai movies from the, you know, if, you know, if you're familiar with Kurosawa or, or uh, uh, what's his name, uh, Kenji Masumi, Masumi, the director of this, uh, those movies are not just kind of these throwaway action movies, like they're really paying homage to a time in their country's history, and the type of men that existed. You know, sure, there's cool shit sometimes and like blood spurting and everything like as they go on in the '70s and whatnot, but. There is like a there's such a beautiful purity and a humanity to a lot of like Japanese filmmaking of this era, uh, where they're really tapping into something like, uh, just like how like just men overcoming their primal natures and just wrestling it into the ground to be better, and not only in, in like in the case of Z- uh, Zataichi, he wants to make the world better, like he understands like what he's done his place he wants to find a way to make recompense for that but. His his primary goal now, in his life, is that so to stop the suffering of others, and he does it with like this beautiful code of honor, and it all starts with the uh, the tale of Zatuichi. Like it all starts here. Like it's such a perfect distillation encapsulation of his character and all characters like him. Like you, you know what? I, am I making sense? Am I just am I just <laughs> going off the rails here? But like no no I, I mean you, yeah I mean. His character is is one that is so likable because he comes from a core place of wanting to set the world straight. He has this immense power to do it. He is also up against this tidal wave of like this zergling rush of like asshole yakuza criminals that every time he cuts one down, two more spawn in its place. So it's like this never-ending struggle against evil. He knows that, but he still chooses to take it on, and that is, you know, yeah. But that's that's the key. Could, that's the key Kim, component. Kim could continually choose to walk away from these situations. And exactly. Doesn't. That's what makes his character. That's the key component of his character. He does it. Like he doesn't fantasize about it. He doesn't think about it. He does it, even though it kind of makes him miserable. But he knows that at the end, he's going to do some good with like kind of these. This tool set he has, however gruesome it is, you know, and that how he, he he knows that there's also no other place for him in the world except being this lowly, blind masseuse. You know, there's everything. This killing to him is rope, motor, motion. Okay, when he there's a scene not in this one but in a later one where he goes to a carnival with uh, a, a girl, and you know, there's always the Ichi girl who wants yeah. to be with him, and he's always like, oh, I, uh, "No, I'm, I'm blind, and I have to kill people. I can't fall in love with you." <laughs> um, and so he's at this um, carnival booth where he's throwing balls at a target, and um, you know, everybody thinks because he's blind, he's not going to hit anything. But he hits, he hits the first one, then he hits another, and another, and everybody's like, "Okay." Uh, everybody starts to get like weirded out by how this blind guy is just like bullseyeing stuff with these balls one after the other. And so you see in slow motion him in real life, the motion of him throwing the ball 
and it hitting the bottle or whatever target it is. And then you see the flashes in his mind of that same motion. It's like in, in, in darkness, uh, if him flashing a sword out and guy like guys just around him, just like flailing, you know what I mean? Like that motion to him, he can't even throw a ball at a carnival without thinking of his training and what yeah. he's trained to do. And again, it goes back to if, if he doesn't step up and do this for the people, who else is going to be able to? And he knows that. Yeah. No, and I think it's and it's great. And I, uh, one of the f- one of the scenes, the introductory scenes of uh, Zataichi in the film is uh, is the gambling scene. It's the dice game. Yes, I love this. This happens in like every single Zatoichi movie. Yeah. <laughs> well, they did develop a formula. Like I, I was, I was actually, I was reading something that like the first three movies are actually like direct sequels to each other. Like if you watch uh, the tales, of the tales of Zatoichi continues. Yeah. Like it's literally like a f- direct follow up to this movie. Yeah. Like he goes back to the village to uh, to visit Hirati's grave in the second one. And uh, what's their name? Um. Uh, Otane. Uh, what's that? Otane is her name. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Otane. She's she's there. Uh, to, they kind of try to like develop that romance a little bit more. Um, but yeah, but that scene itself, I think, is like such a great introduction to his character. Number one, because uh, you see, you know, that he's clever. He's thinking. He knows kind of what people will do. He understands that everybody will almost treat him adversarially, like right off the bat. It's like a playful scene. It's a fun scene. He doesn't have to do it, but he does it to like just fuck with these guys because he's always trying to like show people a new perspective on something. Like he's always trying to like even in his just gambling, even just having fun, even just when he's talking to uh, the Yakuza boss and stuff like that. He's always trying to like kind of like almost like a, a subtle philosophy of like how you should look at things and how you should judge people. Well, he's also he's also. um he is such a power character that he can flex on a room full of dudes and cheat them. But in part of his cheating is setting them up to be cheaters in the first place. So that when yeah. he cheats them, there's already this precedent for, ah, if you can cheat at this game, you can get away with it. And, and so there's this element of like, Ichi is always in control of the situation Yeah, because he's smarter than everybody else around him. He is willing to show you that he'll go down to your level, but he's not on your level. You know what I mean? Well, that's and what I mean. Like he goes. He, like, the reason he he's does. one of my favorite heroes is because he's so arrogant. He'll tell you right to your face. <laughs> this whole room stinks. Everybody in here. What do you? What do you guys all live in this room together? Yeah, I love that. I love. He's like ah, the plum trees, and then he's like, <laughs> and then he turns around. He's like, oh, it smells like filth in here. <laughs> Well, but that's the thing. Like he will, he lowers himself to their level, but it's it's it is to illustrate to them that they're assholes, right? Because like that's the end of it. He's like, oh well, I cheated you, but what were you doing? Right, like exactly. you're saying the only reason I could do this is because, like you said, like it's because uh, what you were trying to do to me. And, and at the beginning, it's a playful thing. It's to show them their own asses. But yeah. then at the end. He he's done with this pretense. He's done with this playfulness, like you said, when he flips out on Sukigoro and you know slashes the sake barrel in half. And uh, you know it, it, it comes right after this moment where uh, the coward Tate, in one of my favorite scenes, he comes up to Zatoichi and uh, he's like, uh, "Hey, thanks for helping us, man. Now that the other two guys are dead, I might have a shot at being second in command." <laughs> and Zatoichi's just like, oh my god! Like this dude doesn't even care about his his his. Uh, the, these dudes weren't his bros. There was no code between these guys. He was yeah. just waiting for them to get taken out so he could get a little bit closer to the scraps from Sukigoro's table. Yeah, because they have they have no honor. They have yeah. no honor, and they're just. I don't know, like what would you call it? Like they're just like these. Uh, they're like, all cowards. S- cowardly selfish ladder climbers just opportunists they just in it for themselves they don't care about they don't even care about like the yakuza boss they don't even care about that there's no loyalty there this is just about like how do i subsist how do i just get by 
They're like the salesman in the sales office in Glengarry Glen Ross if they had top knots and katanas, okay? <laughs> and the only two honorable, competent people or, or warriors <coughs> on the scene are Zatsuichi and Master Hirati. Yeah. And that's why they become quick friends because they clearly see that they're the only two people in the situation that are conducting themselves with any sort of dignity. And, you know, unfortunately, they're the ones who are pitted against one another to kill one another. Yeah. Yeah. And that's in, it's just like I was kind of saying earlier, like, I, I do really feel like there is kind of this hint in the same way that like, you know, Westerns from like the, you know, the mid fifties to like the mid seventies kind of had this, there were kind of examinations of like the death of the West, the death of these kinds of people. Um, and this is kind of Zatuichi kind of is representative in Harate as well. They're kind of representative of like the last guard of this era of a different era. Yeah. They yeah. don't make, they don't make men like that anymore. It just doesn't yeah. happen. They're, they're not going to make them. They're not going to make them anymore. And part of the tragedy of these men's existence is that they're made to kill one another. Yes. And so there becomes this uh, era of diminishing return, which is the one that they're in, where, like, you know, these men who are, like, fucking gargoyles compared to these other fucking dudes. I mean, Herate at one point is taking on, like, 20 of Sukugaru's men. Yeah. And, and, and Sukugaru's cowering, going, oh, we shouldn't have gotten rid of Zatuichi. <laughs> you know, and, 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 and you know, he's willing to hire Zatuichi for, like, he offers him something at the, at, at the beginning, like three grand, like two or three grand or something. Yeah. And Zatoichi throws it back in his face. And, uh, you know, these guys are so cheap and miserly and shitty and willing to backstab one another. And Tate won't even take responsibility for his child. He won't even go into the same room and talk. He won't even talk to his father about it. He yeah. He won't even talk to his dad about it. And he's supposed to be some big, badass Yakuza boss. Yeah. It's like, they're they're all just cowards, and that's another great point that you just brought up about like a uh, uh, is that like you know when he goes to the bridge, he's going there for Harate, he's going there for his like his brother. He's not going there for the rest of the bullshit. He didn't yeah. get you know like he's not going there for the money. He's not going there for that stuff. He doesn't like it. Doesn't matter to him. But he no. met this guy who he knows he's going to be there, and he kind of goes there to kill him. And it's uh, and, it, and it's like the nicest thing he could do, right? Because he knows that that's the only hope that Harate has for a happy ending is you know, and, and again it goes back to this idea of Zatoichi being cursed to be a a man with a good heart who must kill. Yeah, and you know, it just makes me think of all the butchers and slaughtermen out there who have to. Look all the creatures in the eye before we shoot them in the face with a thirty out six. Yeah, um, you know nobody else is going to do it, so you have to do it. And in in Hirate's specific case, like you said, Ichi doesn't get off that boat and start slashing Yakuza. He doesn't go there and start you know kicking everybody's ass and cutting his way through uh, uh, the other guys. Man, it's it's Shing it's Shingezo boss. Yeah, Shingezo is the other. Uh, Yakuza boss. He doesn't start cutting his way through those men. He just gets on the bridge and waits for Harate to show up. Yeah. And then he does his thing. They have their sword fight. And that's it. You know, he's not there for any other thing. And he doesn't take the money at the end. He throws it down and walks away. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's like it's like a, such a like kind of a powerful sentiment that's kind of the through line of his character. And it's something that he also kind of extends to the other people around him. Um, oh my God. I can't, oh, um, Otane. She's like, uh, like he just, he can't have anybody. He's destined to be like this kind of this lonely wanderer. And he doesn't want to do that because of his reputation. He doesn't want her to have to deal with kind of the consequences of his life that he led. And in and, and this really tragic way, like he's just now destined to be alone because he's so responsibly, so honorable. He right. would never dream, even though he obviously, I mean, he touched her face. They're pretty much married as far as I'm concerned. Right. <laughs> that trad life. Um, <laughs> what are you doing? You guys walking in a fucking swamp, touching each other's faces? You're married, buddy. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> She's going to have to stain her teeth black now. Oh, my God. Yeah, which was the thing. 
That was the thing. It's called the oh, Ohaguru, literally black teeth. And it was a, it was like a fashion statement of the time. Yes. And that's how you knew she was low class, you know? She didn't have black teeth. Sorry, bro. Your girl doesn't have black teeth. She must not respect you. But yeah, yeah. I actually, I mean, even though I, I do think if there's like a, a critique I have of the movie, it's like that is pretty undercooked is the romance. Um, but there is like that's the walk home by the river and like with the moon and like that whole scene is I don't even give a shit that it's like not really well developed or whatever. It's such a great scene, such a great moment, so beautifully shot. Yeah. Like and it kind of it, it tells you everything you need to know about like the potentiality of this relationship. Honestly, like you didn't really need to go very deep with it, you know? No, I mean, that's one of the reasons why I kind of wanted to talk about it is because it's not, it's not, uh, it's not, in the same vein of Mad Max, it's not like a super deep movie, but unlike Mad Max, it's remarkably well done. Yes, yes, yes. It's cinematically well done, and the themes are all well developed, and it's like right out of the gate you have this character that's fully formed and that works on so many different levels. Yeah. Well, it shows you just like what like a good director can accomplish. I mean, this guy, for all of you uh, Kill Bill fans out there, uh, he directed uh, Shogun Assassin. That was the last movie he made, Kill Bill. At the end of uh, Kill Bill Volume 2, it's the movie that uh, uh, Beatrix's daughter, BB, wants to watch. But they're like, oh, it's too long. That's Shogun Assassin. I don't know if you've ever seen Shogun Assassin. No. It's like a three-hour movie made by the same director. I think you'd like it. It's really good. Um, he also did something called The Last Samurai from 1974 that was also just another awesome movie. Like He's just a solid director because you can watch some of the other. I watched, I think I watched probably like six or seven of these. And uh, they are very uh, in, inconsistent in their quality. Like there is definitely people that just have a better handle on being like just like this material and how to direct it than others. Like if you watch the, the one that's the direct sequel to this, the tale uh, of Zata, uh, Zata Ichi's continues. Yeah. Like it's, it's a much more straightforward. It's like an hour long. Uh, it's, it's, there's not a lot to it. It's kind of like uh, what you more or less what you would expect from a movie like this actually. Um, and this one, I was just so struck by how thoughtful it was and how, uh, like how it developed its own pace and how it really kind of brought you into that world, that village and uh, these, these characters and really kind of breathe a life into it. Like you felt like you kind of understood the circumstances of the people that live there as, and it wasn't like hyper-focused on like, you know, cool fight scenes and, um, and just like being like just badass stuff. Like it just wasn't like, it was more concerned with, uh, developing thoughtful characters that have actually like this beautiful melancholy kind of tone to it. Whereas a, yeah. whereas a lot of these movies don't, they don't, they just don't have that quality. Like it is, it does kind of stand unique in this genre, I would say. Certainly. And, I, and that's kind of one of the reasons why I wanted to talk about it and you know, I think that when you you go talking about a movie like this, you would initially going into it, if you hadn't seen it, think that when I say that this has one of my favorite sword fights that's ever been put on film, that you you know would think of that it's eighteen minute long, swashbuckling. <laughs> uh, uh, Ewan McGregor has the high ground <laughs> kind of thing, and it's not. It's three movement. There are three movements in the sword fight. Yeah, uh, or maybe four, but I think there's just three, and um, each one is punctuated by this moment of silence in between, where the characters size each other up, and uh, it's just like the, the 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 amount of respect that these characters have for one another, and that's one of the themes of the movie that's so strong is the idea of respect, because in this era in Japan, um, the level of respect that you give to another person is so rigidly defined by the culture. Mm -hmm. And in my notes, when I'm looking back at them, so many of them are about this, this idea of respect and how the mob bosses don't respect the samurai or Ichi at all. 
Yeah. Uh, Ichi to Sukugaru is just a uh, carnival trick. Who will come in and, and slice candles in half for his men on a whim? Yeah. And for Shingezo, uh, Hirate is just a drunk animal that he can feed warm sake to and keep him in a cage as long as he keeps him alive and full of sake until this war pops off. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, th- and this is a th- their generation of men that know better. And that's yeah. also part of what feeds into that. Um, it's like, the, but they've just got to a place where they have such a status and such opulence in, in their kind of small way, but they want to hold on to it. And that's all they care about. They're not living life because of a, a value set in the same way that Zataichi and Harate are. Like these are, these are men of purpose. These are men of, of dignity. And these guys are just like, well, you know, how do we make a, how do we stay rich? How do we stay in power? Right. I guess it's kind of prescient in a sort of weird way. We but, believe- uh, yeah, yeah, and they're and they're well trained men. Like uh, one of my notes, uh, over, you know, in talking about how Zatoichi became such a wonderful swordsman because he wanted respect from people. Because after he was blinded, he couldn't get any respect from people. Um, uh, let's see, um, warriors have nothing but respect for one another. Oh wait, no, it's up here. Uh, he he took up the sword. He took up the sword to uh, start getting respect from normies. Sam Hyde, pro bullying, vindicated. Um, <laughs> it's it's true. The Sam Hyde skit that says uh, that you know we should bully them early and often because if it wasn't for bullying, he wouldn't have had Zatoichi or Michael Jackson. But um, no, it, it, like this this idea of um, being an entire world where the concept of respect is fading away and being replaced by what you said, just this idea of like, how do we kind of stay at the top of the shark tank? And then you have these two honorable men that are, you know, in this little village in the middle of nowhere caught in this Yakuza battle that if one side or the other won, it's going to be no different for the people of that village. It's going to be no different for anybody except the mob bosses who win that particular battle. Yeah. And uh, if it does one good thing, it sets up the architecture of the honor system so that Harate can actually end up getting sort of on a technicality, but not really, uh, an honorable death. Yeah. Because he happens to be pitted up against Zatoichi in battle. And uh, that's just, you know, Man, Miki Hirate is just one of the best character setups of all time for me. He's so tragic and sad at the beginning, just drinking. I know what it's like to be sad and alone and in the mil- middle of like a uh, isolated village somewhere doing your drug of choice into infinity. Yeah. And having no purpose whatsoever. I, I completely... Uh, am able to relate to the character of Miki Hirate because I know what it's like to be like post failure in a dark room, smoking my brains out, and not ha- like literally have no bounds on your ability to consume the thing that's killing you. Yeah, but also no purpose to stop it. Yeah, yeah. And and like in my in my particular way, um, you know. Starting a family was my way out of that. And that's yeah. how I found my purpose. But Mickey, he knows that that's not, for several reasons, that's not on the plate for Mickey. No. Uh, he knows that even if he could walk away from the samurai life, which he can't, he's going to die of tuberculosis anyway. So he's, he you know, has this golden opportunity to get his, his uh, honorable way out. But you got to sword fight your best friend and he's going to kill you. Yeah, yeah. No, I I, uh, I completely uh, empathize. I completely understand because, like uh, as you said, like you started a family to get your way out. Like that's the same thing I did. Like we have that in common. Like it's just like same, very, very much uh, the same sentiment. So I I totally agree, and I I really uh, really love and appreciate your affection for that character because I think it's like I said. I think it's easy to kind of overlook the nuances of what his life is and what he's going through. I don't think it's, yeah, he it's doesn't, he doesn't have the chance to have that light bulb go off and be like, oh, maybe if I started a family of people that I love, that would bring me like purpose and meaning. He doesn't even he doesn't even have that opportunity. 
No, he's, yeah. you know, like he could very easily die today, and his whole entire legacy, all all the things that he trained for, all those early days as a samurai that we don't get to see on screen, his heroic uh, early days as as uh, when he had his Padawan braid and he was jumping around with uh, <laughs> young Ewan McGregor. Um, <laughs> did we watch the same movie? Because there was a like. Did this have Hayden Christensen in it? <laughs> no, but like yeah, uh, and people are gonna listen. And Hayden Christensen, people are gonna people are gonna reconsider. Give it twenty years. Duh, man, <laughs> we can do a whole other video about why the prequels are awesome now. Um, yes, uh, actually, yes. Uh, how they should, actually uh, feel like Star Wars. <laughs> uh, but you know, uh, Mickey knows that uh, he has no other way out, and so. You know that that that's that's. But that's the beautiful sentiment of the friendship that he develops with uh, Zatoichi is that like it's, it is, revivifies his purpose. He didn't have it, like yeah, and just like you know, uh, Dan beautifully expressed like this sense of being unmoored from life, and you're just subsisting, you're just existing, you're it's everything's mechanical, and you're just hurting yourself, and you're being self destructive. And then he meets Zataichi, and he's like, "I have a reason to go a little bit further in my like with my in my purpose," which is a powerful thing. Like so many of us, so many people, just kind of lose sight of that. And it's so gratifying if in your life you can experience people that kind of reorient reorientate you back that way, whether it's just a friend to talk to, or it's like having a family or whatever. Like it's. Is like it, it, in a weird way, Zatoichi, without meaning to, like saves him, like saves his soul, for lack of a better way to put it, <clears throat> right? Like, because right, right. he would have been like damned to this, like a footnote of history. Nobody have ever would have known who he was, but now, however morbid it is, like he will be written in a book as somebody that Zatoichi killed, and like, and and his his samurai career can now be looked at as. He had these peaks, and then he had a low, but then he died honor. You know, he did have a low part, but he then he then died honorably. Yeah, and you know, it, it can be sort of, you know, the box on the left can be checked instead of the box on the right, and his soul can go to that particular place. Yeah, um, it's just a it's it's a thing in the human psyche. He wants to know that his soul, his his legacy is going to be taken care of after he dies. And again, it goes back to no other person can do this but Zatoichi. Zatoichi is in a very particular place to be able to provide this yeah. for Mickey. And it's it's his curse once again. You're so good at killing that not only is it going to be the thing that you have to do even though you don't want to do it, you're going to have to do it to the only people that you make friends with because yeah. it's just the way that it is, Ichi. Yeah. Well, it's because they have respect for the sense of uh, that value set, that code. Like that is how they, that's, it's like having principles and that's how you live your life. Like, you know, like you live your life by a set of principles rather than like whatever's convenient in the moment. Like that's not what they're doing. Like these are, these are principles because they apply them ubiquitously. Like they're not out there picking and choosing when they want to do it. Then, eh, you know, I don't, I don't need to do it this time. No, no it's like, no, it's very hard edged. It's very like it's very almost religious in a way. In a way, it's what guides them, and uh, and that's it's something that is unique to them in this scenario in this movie specifically, right? Uh, and, and that's what's constantly the juxtaposition of the characters is constantly that it's constantly Zatuichi being that guy and having to deal with like uh, like Tate and all these assholes and the Yakuza dudes and then Harate just being so frustrated. That he can't, like, he has to be around these people. I have to talk to you. I have to deal with you. You know? Yeah, but, and, and you know, this <clears throat> this uh, idea of, like, like, Tate, so many of the men, including Zatoichi's father, Tate as a father, Tate as a person, as a, as a, uh, uh, a professional. Um, all of them are derelict of duty. Yeah. Like none of them are willing to step up. Like Sukugaru, when he leads his men into battle, like we said several times, just runs away yeah. because he's a total pussy. 
all the men in this story are derelict of their duty except Zatoichi and Hirate. And um, one of my notes was uh, absent fathers are, are everywhere in this movie. Um, yeah. You know, that, 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 that idea of a man who just sets down his duty and walks away from it and how the burden of that responsibility doesn't just go away and ends up falling on the shoulders of other men. Exactly. I mean, it's and it's both metaphorical and literal in the case of Tate. It's more of a literal thing. But like if you think about the Yakuza bosses and their role in the hierarchy of the people they are, it's a complete failure of leadership because these guys are pawns. You know, not everybody is destined to be the king. Not everybody is destined to be a leader. That's just not the way the world works. But these guys, like if they were under the tutelage of people that were honorable, of people that were a good example, of people that, uh, you know, lived by the code. Of the, of the time period, of their fathers. Like, that would have made those men better men. But because, like, it's the tree is rotten, so the apples are rotten. You know what I mean? Yeah, and, and, and these guys are just golems. Like, they're, they're, they're husks of people. Like, there's a scene where Tate is in the same room as Zatoichi, and he's talking to Otane, and uh, he's he's trying to make it seem like he's not there but of course Ichi knows he's there even though he's blind he knows he's there and uh, as he's leaving Tate makes some kind of sound or something and Zatoichi says is someone there? I guess not and then laughs (laughs) and walks away and it's just like uh, you know um, stating the fact that Tate is not uh, is someone there? I guess not no he's not even there's no one there yeah. He is a shell of a person. He's a golem person. Yeah. And these men are all that way. They're all just cowards. And they're kind of stupid too, you know, like Oh yeah, they're they're dumb thugs, but they're dumb thugs, I think, as like a product of their environment and their and their leadership. I think like in the same like if you just look at the Yakuza bosses as like kind of a metaphor for like fathers in the same way that Tate is like an absent father that makes somebody like go do something extreme, like these guys, they're I mean, who the fuck are they looking up to? Who the, who do they have to look up to? The right. only people that can that tell them what to do, that they have any sense of loyalty in a very broad sense, um, are fucking they're they're de- like they're degenerates. Like they're not like they're not good people. This is what happened to the Italians in the nineties. You ever see Goodfellas? No, I'm just joking. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, I mean it's it's true, and and uh, Ichi continually depersons Tate. Uh, because he knows from the beginning scene that he is a piece of shit from uh, treating him, uh, you know, fr- from from tricking uh, Tate to getting Sukuguru to make Tate clean his loincloth and then give him a massage to, uh, you know, telling him, asking him if someone's there and then nobody's there. And then at the very end, when Tate tries to get his final shot in on Zatoichi and Ichi doesn't even have a sword, he just like, he just elbows him into the lake, and uh, he says, actually, yeah, that was awesome. I love that scene. Yeah. He says something like, uh, "I oh, guess it was nothing." Just been some nobody or something like that. And keeps walking <laughs> yeah. away, and they do that great cut <laughs> back to the water and the bubbles coming up in the from the mud in the in the stream. Yeah. Oh exactly. yeah, it was great. It was so good. Uh, like you know, and also like we haven't really talked about the performances too much. Uh, Shintaro Katsu, who is the who is the uh, the character Zatoichi? Um, what a great performance! Uh, he was with this character from 1962, and this was made all the way to 1989, which is the final Zatoichi film, because uh, they did 25 from 62 to 73, and then they did a hundred episode TV series. Yeah, and then he came back and basically, and I have never seen this movie, and I'm gonna go. I would need to watch it. He basically did the Logan. Zatoichi movie, like old man yeah. Zatoichi. He I gotta see this movie. I, I I found out about this today while I was doing a little more research because, of course, as much as I love these movies, it was like like you, know, you said, so there's 29 of them. Yeah. So you uh, you know you can't unless you're very very uh, interested in watching the whole collection, which you know I'm too busy to do that anymore. Uh, but yeah, this one in particular because he directed it. And um, like you said, it's like old man Logan kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. I'm very intrigued, very excited to go check that one out. Actually, you know, for the folks at home, uh, most of these movies, if not all of them, are on YouTube for free. Uh, There's a 
channel called Had Education. I will try to remember to put the link in the description, but I think it has all of the original 25 movies are on that uh, on that channel. Or if you want to be fancy, they're also on the Criterion channel because Criterion has the rights uh, to it. So they uh, they did, you know, beautiful remasters and like, you know, never looked better. But if you just want to watch the movies, you want to dip your dip your toe into it. Uh, they are on YouTube. So that's very cool. Uh, but like what I wanted to say about his performance, his he, he is so unassuming. He is so disarming. He's so charming. And this really like kind of affable, just almost like kind of goofy way. Yeah. Just, you know, like I love that about him. I love that he's not some like stick in the mud, Clint Eastwood, stoic character. Like he's really funny and acerbic and he makes jokes and uh, he's cutting up with people and he's like, you know what I mean? Like he's got like this really like a sarcasm to him that I, I really loved in a main character like this because he's not your prototypical main ter- main character because there's things about him that you could say are like, you know, the, the reluctant hero, the hero's journey. There's there's archetypes in there, but the way that he plays the character um, turns it into something completely idi- idiosyncratic and unique. Like it's just like I'm trying to like think of a of a like a parallel to him like in terms of like you know just a movie character other than maybe like the dude <laughs> uh the ninja turtles oh yeah actually good good pull good pull, good pull. i think that that's one of the reasons why i love zatoichi so much is because his sense of humor is much like a comic book like spider-man or the ninja turtles like yeah like you said very sarcastic acerbic uh but also funny and uh you know he, he he's not going to be an asshole to characters that don't deserve it, but the characters that he sniffs out are evil and that deserve it. He's going to absolutely humiliate in every way that he can. And he but will, he, but he does it like the, the weird way that he does it though. Like even with the, the bastards, even with the assholes, like he's like, he's also almost like trying to get them to like him. Like, you know what I mean? Like in the way that like, you know, we're, we're from new England. Like this is a very, I guess maybe a new England trait is the, uh, is the sarcastic dude <laughs> and everybody kind of like undercutting each other and quipping out, quipping each other and kind of tearing each other down in fun, interesting linguistic ways. Well, one not... of the, one of the jobs that blind guys had in that time was also sort of like a storytelling bard entertainer type thing. Yeah. Yeah. And so like being able to ingratiate himself to a group of assholes like, that are drinking at a bar in order to make some uh, money off of them, is a trait that a character like Zatoichi would have. Yeah. Um, if he didn't have his sword play, that's how he would be making his money. And actually, there's, uh, again, I've, I've seen a few of them, and I can't remember specifically which ones, but there is a scene in a later one where he is voluntarily like putting on a comic show yeah. where he's doing like, a dance and a little song and you know, um, sort of showing off his skill set as a blind masseuse, you know, yeah. aside from being a swordsman. And so, you know, that sort of aspect of his personality of being a fool, uh, a knowing idiot. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you know, that I, I've always really liked that about him. And the fact that he would say, like at the beginning, when he says with a smile that they all stink. <laughs> and, uh, you know, <laughs> it, it's just his delivery is so classic. But I love that the characters are like, they're like offended, but they're also like, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Because he, you know, and what I like about it too is just not like affectation for entertainment's sake. It's actually like it's very core to his character. It's because Zatsuichi is a reactionary character. Like you know, uh, besides just the plot that you know he goes to a village or he goes to a town and he kind of has to deal with whatever the problem of the village of a town is. Um, he's he's a uh, what's the word I'm looking for? He's like a uh, 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 brain fart. He's a. Uh, he has to kind of. What the fuck was I gonna say? <laughs> I just had a complete brain fart. Yeah, I've I've had too much wild turkey one hundred and one to uh, be able to pull you out of that hole. I'm sorry. That's okay. That's okay. I did it to myself. Oh no, he uses that like his like this way to like kind of undercut the tension of scenes. He uses it to his advantage. Like this part of like uh of like all like his 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 skill set, his talent, like you were saying, like it's but it's there for a purpose. 
it's meaningful. It's not just there for kind of just stupid entertainment. Oh, we're just going to stick a joke in here. Like we're not, no, it's not what it's for. It's actually all like means something. It's all purposeful uh, in a way that like a lot of times you, when you have comic relief in a, in a film like this, it's not like, it's just, that's not what the, the goal of it is. But for him, it's endemic to his character. Like that's who he is. That's how he subsists in the world. Like, because he knows he's blind. He's also a thing that I really liked about his character as well is that he completely just embraces the fact that he's blind in every aspect. Like when he's dealing with people and he uses it as a, like a virtue for himself and the way he can kind of uh, adjudicate like his, his justice or adjudicate like his, his intention in a scene or whatever. Like he's constantly using those people against themselves because of the, pres- the presumptions they have about him because he's blind. And, uh, and they, they're able to kind of weave like an entertaining fabric with that, which is not something like, cause it's not like precious about it. It's not like overly like pointed in a way that, uh, that could be like obnoxious. And I thought like, it's just very, uh, just the way the performance, like, uh, the way that Shintaro Katsu does it, the way he performs it, he just really nailed it. Like really nails the tone of the character, um, where I could see it going way too broad in the hands of somebody else. Yeah, and you know what? I, I never even thought about because um, I know that there are other incarnations of Zatsuichi where other people play the character, but I've never seen them. I've only ever seen him play the character, and uh, to think that like how much of the character is him baking that into the character, you you t- you kind of take for granted um, what's on screen sometimes with a character like Zatsuichi because it's so convincing and. Um, He's done so well, but uh, the acting of, of both him and uh, the guy who played Miki Hirati and the girl who played Otani, but spe- specifically Zatoichi and Hirate, like the close-ups on their faces <clears throat> in some of the scenes, um, they have a very sort of a Tom Hardy-esque control over their facial expressions yeah. where... Um, they can communicate so much with one tiny movement of their eyelid or whatever. <clears throat> and that type of acting is, um, it's, it's, it's hard to come by. And uh, you have both main characters in this movie played by ar- actors who are very comfortable in that realm. And it shows up on the screen. Yeah, it's like, it's the, uh, the internal, internal acting, they call it, I think, uh, where it's just like, they feel like those people, like there's something going on underneath, underneath like what you're actually seeing. And they're able to somehow communicate it with their physicality. It's like they are embodying the character in, in, from a psychological perspective and they're able to communicate that to the audience. It's not something everybody can do. You know? right, because what they're doing is doing, uh, um, they're doing facial expressions that are um, more expressive than people would do in real life. But yeah. also not doing them to such an extent that it's too much. Yeah, it needs to show up on the screen, but it can't show up on screen so much that it takes the viewer out of it. Yeah, and um, that's the type of physicality that both of these actors have. Yeah, that's why. Like, that's why I really love the Katsu's performance as uh, Zatoichi because it is like you could see it going wrong. You could just see it being bad and played too broad. But like you said, like he just like. They just, those guys, they just like kind of got the perfect balance of kind of this overly expressive, but not like it just doesn't ever go off the rails. Yeah, it doesn't like turn into like the Joker. Like, you know, I'm like cast Jim Carrey as Zatoichi. <laughs> I'd pay to see that. Sure. Why not? <laughs> but, but, but like Jim Carrey in 1992. <laughs> like, uh, like overboard. Off the rails. <laughs> Fucking the, in living color days. Yeah, exactly. He's up there doing like Jack Nicholson impressions and shit. Elastic Man, is that what they used to call him? Yeah, Fire Marshal Bill. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, that's kind of like a, that's that's my bag on that. I mean, do you have any final thoughts, or do you have anything else you want to discuss about uh, Zatsuichi? I think we did a pretty good pretty good run down there. Yeah, no, it's 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 a very uh, short. Um, you know, it's a what like an hour twenty five minutes. Um, with credits and everything, yeah, um, you know it's it's a short, succinct movie. All of them are, 
I don't think that there's any epic Zatsuichi movies. I would like to check out um, the one from, uh, what, 82 or whatever. Uh, where, where 89. Like, 89. 89 is actually like uh, six years before he died or eight years before he died. Yeah, Old Man yeah. Zatsuichi. I would like to check that one out because I haven't. Uh, I didn't even know it existed until I started poking around on Wikipedia. Oh, dude, it's got that great, like, 80s, like, cinematography and, like, the lighting. It's Oh, dude, it looks so rad. I just watched the trailer for it. I was like, oh, shit. Nice. I gotta find that. I gotta, I gotta track this down. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, that's about it. I, I, you know, I talked uh, mostly about what I wanted to talk about, which is, you know, the character the character of the samurai and the character of Zatoichi and their interplay together. It's just one of my favorite character interplays that I've ever seen on screen. And it's basically the reason that I wanted to talk about this movie was because you don't often get to see characters that they have a relationship that's built so well, but they only get to exist on screen together for less than 90 minutes. Yeah. And it's very, very bittersweet. And I think that um, anybody who likes this genre of movie, um, you know, Kung Fu sword stuff, um, check out Zatoichi, but do it with a, with a, a, a slower kind of mind. It's not going to be Kill Bill. No, it's not going to be Kill Bill. It's not going to be Kill Bill. Um, but if you can sit and have patience and take it in, um, there's there's so many little moments in this movie that, you know, I wrote uh, uh, the drinking scene of so wholesome, name a more iconic duo. I mean, <laughs> the, the friendship between these two characters is just one of my favorite things that's ever been in a movie. And... It may, it's one of the reasons why I like to go back and watch this movie because even though those characters don't get to like ride off into the sunset together and like have a serial of dramas together, their one little story together is so perfectly crafted and told. Yeah. And you can go back and watch it. It's easy to watch. It's, 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 it's so easy on the eyes. And uh, the story is well told. And it's just, uh, man, as... as as far as like bittersweet tragedies go, the story of the those two friends is just one of my favorites. Yeah, no, I can't agree more. And uh, really, thank you so much for suggesting the movie because you know it's something that's like on a list somewhere that I have. You know, of things that I'm like oh, I gotta I gotta check those out. I gotta watch those. Right. And uh, and uh, finally getting around to this because I wasn't sure if I had seen it. I was like, oh, I know what Zatoichi is. I've seen so many of these kinds of movies over the years. Um, and I don't think I had, and uh, I was so taken with the movie then. Like I was just so taken. I literally watched it twice, in like the same night. Nice. I was drinking a little bit, but like I was sitting at the, here at my desk, and kid and wife are asleep, and uh, you know I pop it in the first time, and I'm like, oh my god, oh my god, I'm like getting so into it, and uh, I was just like, let's play it again, Sam. Let's go. That's so good. Yeah. Yeah, I was so, so, like, just taken with it. Because I do think it, there's something so, like, not only just prescient about it, but there's just, like, a, such a such a simplistic beauty to it. Like, you know, I love when a, Corey, when a story can just kind of cut through all the bullshit and just, like, give me something that I, f- like, I can feel. Like, I, can, right. I felt it, you know? Without all of the pomp and circumstance, you know, it's just it was a it's just a beautiful it's a simply made movie, a beautifully made movie. I think uh, if you're a, if you're a film fan, you owe it to yourself. It is incredibly well made, especially if you put in considering the time it was made, the budget they probably had. Uh, really, just some gorgeous stuff. I mean, oh my god! Like uh, when Zatsuichi's walking home. <laughs> Which is like another little like funny joke in the movie. They're like, "Hey, it's dark out. You gotta be careful." He's like, "Oh, I'll, I'll be all right." Yeah. <laughs> He's yeah. walking home, and Harate basically sends those goons out to die to test him. And uh, oh my god, like one of the most beautifully shot things. It's obviously on. A, it's so stylized. It's on a. That's what's another great thing about the movie. It kind of like it goes back and forth between this very like naturalistic feel to this these super stylized moments. And this is something that I think carries on throughout the series as well. Uh, uh, where they almost like go into like these weird fantasy moments, uh, but like it is so rad. Like it's not like like Dan was saying. Like these are not like these these drag out fights that go on for forty five minutes or whatever. It's like no, it's this beautiful, elegant moment of Zatuichi in this dark forest with these trees and the moonlight and there's smoke and he's on a path and he's just like whoosh, 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 he's done. Like, it's just perfect. 
It's so yeah. perfect. Yes. Like, and I, I honestly like it's, it's been, uh, I've been like, you know, like I said, like since I watched this, since we talked about watching it, like I've been like, you know, just kind of watching the other ones. And as much as I like the other ones, there's some really cool moments. I don't think, I don't know, like as I've seen thus far, I think this one is perfectly encapsulates what this character is supposed to be. So I'm actually interested into into checking out the other Zatuachi, Zatu, Zatoichi movies, excuse me, that Kenji Misumi did, the guy who directed this. He only did like five of them. And they're like spread out throughout the series. But like I feel like he was a big part of like like the control mechanism of like how it all comes together. Like right. he had such a beautiful eye. He just had such a beautiful like control of tone and like and uh and character and like was a real guide for these for the story. So I'm definitely interested in checking out uh, the rest of his Zatoichi stuff. And also, if you guys are a fan of just Zatoichi, I would suggest Shogun Assassin. It's the last movie Kenji Misumi made. And also uh, The Last Samurai from 1974. Not the Tom Cruise one. Not the oh, Tom yeah, Cruise they did, one. They did a deep fake where they put Tom Cruise into that one. Oh, did they really? Yeah. Did you, well, no. Did you see all the new deep fakes with Tom Cruise? I have. Yes. I saw that one guy. There's this one dude. Uh, I think he's like on TikTok or whatever. And I saw those and I was like, we're getting close to a scary place. Yeah, I'm actually asleep right now. <laughs> I've been asleep for two days, actually. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's like, have you ever seen a, like, it's like, imagine, you ever see the movie Kung Pao? Oh, yeah. They took that dude and he went and he, he got like all of the footage from his, these old samurai movies, these old kung fu movies, and inserted himself in that. Imagine what you could do today. Wow. I mean, like you could actually do it, like, and probably be fairly seamless. Yeah, you could do it, and you could do it on like a MacBook Pro. I know. Yeah, I'm telling you guys. Listen, Kung Pao Two. The time is right. We could really do something here. Really, something special. Dude, we could dude, do the tale of Kung Pao. Pao. I'm starving now. Uh, now I just want a big steaming plate of like General Sal's. Oh, oh, some nice rice underneath it. <sighs> And you just kind of like fold the rice into the oh yeah I, I live on top of a mountain in the middle of vermont everything closes at six o'clock and is a half hour away you can't the nearest chinese food is like 45 minutes away from me you cannot be talking like this right now i apologize a thousand apologies a thousand apologies hopefully i don't know hopefully you got something in the fridge i guess <laughs> no I, i'm actually uh i'm the opposite of starving i uh i eat way too many uh full disclosure Hopefully, Caitlin doesn't hear this. I ate way too many potato chips <laughs> when I started this podcast, and uh, they have not gone very far. They're, it's just a brick of potato in my stomach right now. It's, it's <laughs> so gross. Yeah, I can. I hear you. <laughs> oh yeah, when just that shit's just sitting in your stomach, and then you feel like it's formed like literally a brick, and you're just like it just weighs you down. But makes your you, posture fold when you're when you're eating all dressed potato chips. And it's so flavorful, and the flavor doesn't stop. And your your tongue's like, wait a second, hold on, hold on, hold on. I think there's a little more flavor. Can you can you can throw we try this again? One of those on me because I think yeah. there's another flavor on there that I didn't quite get. It's only happened like one time in my life. I found the bottom of my stomach. Like I was high as a fucking kite. Uh, me and my roommate. So I was like 23. Me and my roommate playing Donkey Kong co-op. For literally like twelve hours, like we beat all three games on Super Nintendo, and uh, and and within like forty five minute period, I ate like a bag of Cheetos, a bag of Doritos, like half a DiGiorno's pizza. Oof. Yeah, and I was just like, I couldn't stop, Dan. I had the same thing. You're just like, this is so good. This is so right right now. This is so fucking right. And you just keep shoveling and shoveling, and then suddenly. I felt like somebody had kicked me in the fucking nuts and I was like on the floor in physical pain. Never has ever happened again. I've never done that since. But uh, yeah, that, <laughs> that was the only time I've ever had that kind of experience where it's just like I found the end. I found where <laughs> I found the end of where this can this can go. One time Kevin Spacey tied me to a chair and fed me like a pallet of SpaghettiOs. It was oh, disgusting. <laughs> Um, but no, uh, too far off the rails. But anyway, yes. Um, Kevin Spacey, no are you no sure those were spaghettios? Are you, sure? 
Are you sure those are SpaghettiOs, buddy? No, actually, and I'm not maybe, sure it was uh, maybe more Kevin like Spacey. He was Ken, speaking with a southern accent. Come, Gettios. Uh, <laughs> the southern accent. He's speaking in monologue. He keeps turning, and I, I swear to God, it's like he's it's like a camera there. That's a weird did, guy. Did you miss me? Did you think I was gone? And I was like, I don't know who you are. I've never seen the show. I don't have any context for oh this. Oh, my God. Yeah. One of the funniest, darkest things probably ever. Really, and he just puts these out at the random. He's just sitting by a, like, kill them with kindness. Like, a day after the guy that was going to testify against him dies in a car accident, you're like, Jesus Christ, Spacey. Timing. Anyways, you know who doesn't try to fuck kids? Satsuichi. You wouldn't even dream of it. Too yeah, much honor. Yeah, yeah. And who would probably slice Kevin Spacey's throat open? Definitely oh, yeah. not to reach him. Yeah, I mean, he would try to talk to him first, I think, but... <laughs> he, would, he would cheat him. Uh, he would cheat him in dice. And yeah. then be like, ha, 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 ha. you smell like a, like, I'm not going to, I'm not even going to go. And I forgot we're recording. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no. so, yeah, but uh, <laughs> thank you, everyone. Check out the tale of Z- Zatsuichi. Seriously, do yourself a favor. Uh, if you've never seen this, like I said, it's on YouTube. I will try to remember to leave a link in the description. Um, it is well worth your time. I'm, I'm telling you, like, uh, just a kind of a touching movie in a weird way. Like, it shouldn't be. You wouldn't think movies like this would be touching, but it is. Yeah. Not in the way that Kevin Spacey might be touching, <laughs> but touching nonetheless. All right, Prophet, thanks so much for joining me, man. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Have a good night, man. All right, everybody. Goodbye.